everyone. Thank you so much to our participants for joining us today. Just as a quick reminder, all of our online events hosted by GSA are covered by our code of conduct. You may find the link for that in the chat. If you have any technical issues during today's seminar, I will be monitoring the chat. So please post there and I will do my best to troubleshoot for you. With that, I will turn us over to Kelly. Great, thanks, Jessica. Uh, my name is Kelly Carroll and I am an assistant professor at Wofford College in South Carolina. And I am the chair of Brumar for this academic year. We're really excited to have so many new people here today and many people who haven't attended a Brumar event before. I'm going to give you a quick update on our uh, what we're planning for Brumar in the future and sort of who we are and how we got started. So Brumar is a grassroots organization. It was originally founded by members of the yeast community about five years ago, um, and we have since expanded to include people working on lots of different model organisms. Our overall goal, as you can see on the slide, is to build a network of teaching and research faculty dedicated to increasing experiential learning at, for biology students, primarily at the undergraduate level. Uh, we tend to have two main programming events every year. The micro brew that you're attending today, we hold in the winter. Um, and then we really have a big brew event sometime in the summer that tends to run over a couple of days over uh, during a week. If you haven't already, please do explore our website um, and look at some of the past done and resources that we have collected. Um, please also make sure to join our mailing list if you haven't already. If you registered for the conference, we've now got your email and you should be on future communications that uh, we send out. Um, one other heads up, we'll be sending out a survey sometime hopefully next week um, to get some feedback about the event from today and future programming that you'd like us to see. So please keep an eye on that and, and fill it out and give us some, some information. Um, and with that, I'll turn the floor over to Dondra Bailey, who's one of our steering committee members who uh, led the planning for today's event. Dondra. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dondra Bailey. I'm a faculty member at Coppin State University, and I bring you greetings um, to Microbrew. So we're so excited to have you here um, attending the Microbrew. I'd just like to let you know that the flow of the meeting, we're going to go as um, printed. This is the subcommittee, myself. Also, um, all the committee members are on the call. Um, Sean uh, Coleman um, from Wartburg, April Rich from Carnegie Mellon, University of Pittsburgh, and Josie, um, which, who is an associate professor um, as well. So we bring you greetings um, to the meeting, and we're just so excited that you um, are able to join us. We will go through the agenda as it is printed, and we will also make sure that we are going through the GSA code of conduct. Um, all questions, you're welcome to put them in the chat as well. And if you have any questions, um, um, just make sure that you can um, submit them. And Jessica will also be monitoring the chat as well as um, all of the committee members. Our um, agenda is as printed here um, on the screen. We will start with our first keynote speaker and I will have our other committee member introduce um, that speaker. All right, <clears throat> excuse but me, first, good afternoon, everybody. But Sean, could we, first we'll do a welcome from um, um, Josie too. Okay. I did not prepare just, any comments. Just a brief welcome. <laughs> I thought that Kelly was taking care of it. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Um, so should I, I have the PDF of the agenda. Should I put that in the chat? Um, yes, that'd be great. Thank okay. you. Yes. Right. So, so thanks, Josie. Sean. All right. Um, hello, everybody. I'm Sean Coleman, and it's my distinct pleasure today to introduce Dr. Davidis Smith, uh, Associate Professor of Life Sciences at Texas A&M uh, University, San Antonio. Um, I got to know Davida uh, through all of her various activities, uh, including uh, using bioinformatics in the classroom. Uh, one of the places to find her is definitely uh, look for RemNet. And they do uh, usually at least once a year, maybe once a, once a semester, um, an online webinar on how to use bioinformatics. Uh, she got her PhD in microbiology from the University of Dublin, uh, Trinity College. She had various stops before landing as an associate professor of life sciences at Texas A&M. Um, she's devoted to undergraduate education and research. She was uh, or is a 
Fellow for Partnership for Undergraduate Life Science Education, or PULSE, and now an ambassador as of 2021. She was also appointed Deputy Director of the National Center for Science and Civic Enga Engagement, where she specifically works with CENSOR, which is a science education for new civic engagements and responsibilities. So if you're interested in that, please reach out to her. She also uh, was given the award, the teaching award from the National Association of Biology Teachers College and University section. And finally, she's the co-PI on the NSF uh, RCN UBE Research Experiences and Microbiomes Network, which is mainly what she's gonna talk about today. And also NSF IU's Vision and Change in Undergraduate Ge General Education Biology courses. With that, I'll turn it over uh, to Davida and uh, thank you very much. Talking away to myself, of course, because I'm muted. And um, thank you for the lovely introduction, Sean. I appreciate it. Um, and I'm I'm delighted that you gave us a plug for Remna because I'm actually going to talk predominantly about Remna today. So, um, if any of you want to con connect with me, I'm on Instagram. I'm on Twitter, formerly formerly Twitter, and uh, obviously my email. I'll share with you in the chat, and so you're all welcome to get in touch. Um, this talk is going to focus on, as I said. As I'm predominantly an educator, frankly, I, I spend my life teaching students and I try to do research in the classroom, but I've been at a lot of kind of resource limited institutions. So bioinformatics for me is, is a gateway to engaging students in, in STEM when you often don't have a lot of money at your, at your disposal, right? So um, on we go. So I love to use the microbiome in my classes. And one of the reasons why I like to use the microbiome is because guess what? Everything and everywhere has a microbiome, right? So uh, to quote the quote I always use is like swab all the things truly you can just go out there and you can swab all the things but if you look at you know human microbiomes like depending on your institution your what you have in terms of biosafety you may or may not be able to do human microbiomes but the the built environment microbiome that's in the middle is fam fabulous to study right and then obviously depending on what you're interested in Sean is a, a collaborator of mine he often likes to study the soil, right? And there's tons of things you can do with soil microbiomes. So the microbiome is a great way to get students to engage with not only microbiology, but also in the analysis that comes with an understanding the microbiome. So, so basically why? It's because you can get your students engaged, right? So I'm going to mute that person. Oh, there you go. And um, you can get your students engaged. So let's look at this. And um, I just want you to see this. this is a picture from the new school where I used to work before I moved to Texas. These are all students who came to the new school to become artists and, and theater majors and you know actors and so on and so forth. And there they are at the bench using a magnet to, to prep their libraries, right? So I actually have them go through the whole motion of making the libraries at my school. And we were lucky enough to have a sequencer there. But you can see here on the right-hand side, there's all these other ways you can get the students out there. They could be swabbing the, the soil, they could be swabbing the grounding, swabbing statues. Um, but there's literally a ton of different things you can do. And at the core of Brewmore, obviously, is this idea to get your students to experience science by doing science, right? And this is a great way to do it, right? So Remnet, what is Remnet? We're funded by the NSF as, as uh, Sean alluded to, we have a grant in RCN UBE, and our mission is effectively to try and build a community of practice, right? So we want to get folks out there who can engage with the microbiome and build it into their curriculum, right? So we have faculty across the United States and beyond, frankly, at all different levels, right from high school, all the way up to kind of fourth year capstone experiences and in intro bio. Um, and they're all kind of getting engaged with the microbiome at different levels of scale. Like, let's be let's be clear here. Not everyone has their own sequencer. But as I'm going to show you, you can do a lot of things with this. But your starting point is and our, and our mission is that we want microbiomes to be available for everyone. So our, our mission statement is microbiomes for all with a couple of ex exclamation point there. Um, so this paper is lovely. This was written by Theo and Avron, our two, uh, my, co my PI and my co-PI. It's in Frontiers in Microbiology. And if you're looking for kind of inspiration as to how you could start here, there's a bunch of papers cited in this, in this article, this review article, and they show you at all the different ways they've incorporated this type of teaching tool into their classrooms from undergrad to high school to even graduate level classes. And you can see all the range of different classes you can have on the right hand side there from molecular biology to ecology to, to microbiology and beyond. So there's really no way there's there's no there's no limits here as to what you can do, frankly. Um, you can start with something as simple as surfaces of elevator buttons, which is where I got my start. Um, and as I said, we are not alone in this. So here's Bernadette Connor. She's a member of, of Remnet. And here she is writing a paper on amplicons, metagenomes, metatranscriptomes from sediment. So our members are amazing. They, they actually are going out 
and pre presenting and publishing on what they're doing with their students. So it's a way to get students not only to, to dabble in bioinformatics, but also for them to publish, right? Um, here's Sean. Here's here's a plug to Sean. I saw him at, he's presented at numerous conferences um, on the work that he's doing with his undergrads. And these are research uh, active students who are getting to publish papers. And I know he just published a paper quite recently. And um, so it's a wonderful thing. And he himself has used the tools that we talk about in, in Remnet, the, the workshops and such that we offer. So it's a it's a great way to kind of start if you're if you're unsure of yourself and what to do, but also then again to combine it with research, to combine it with what you're learning in the classes. Um, Emmet is another one, uh, developed a tool that would allow you to extract environmental DNA and then uses the tools, chime and everything else to analyze the microbiomes in the classroom. So what can you do? But as I said, there, the, the options are kind of limitless, right? But one of the things I did want to point out is that um, our, our societies across the country, they're, they're kind of getting with the program now. And the ASM, the American Society for Microbiology, has actually developed new guidelines and they're going to be coming out in, in the coming months. And in these new guidelines, they actually have in there, they didn't before, they actually explicitly mention bioinformatics tools now. So it's it's coming in the sense that we have to consider how to get bioinformatics into the classroom and how to make it something that's it's accessible and inclusive of all. So the nice thing about the, bio, the microbiome, as I said before, is that for microbiologists, we spend a lot of our time trying to culture things, but so many of us never culture things anymore. We just go and we get some DNA and we, we sequence it, right? So this, this basically shows that our societies are getting with the program. They're understanding now that so many of us are engaged in discovery. You know, we're going out and we're finding new things and we're doing it through bioinformatic means. So it's critical for, the, for this to be considered. And another thing that's really important is when you're designing your courses, you can have, you can, the, the, the sky's the limit with respect to where you go. And as Sean alluded to, he mentioned sensor. I try to teach my students through civic engagement, right? So civic engagement is another way that you can get your students to be engaged. But I do civic engagement with microbiomes tackling problems, right? So I like to look at contaminated rivers, or I like to look at antimicrobial discovery, or I like to look at gentrification of neighborhoods, right? Urbanization, the impact of urbanization. So when you think about this and you incorporate microbiomes and you incorporate bioinformatics, the impact you have on your students is incredible. It's almost immeasurable, right? So here we go. We start off with a diverse microbial community, whatever that might look like. And most of us, to be honest with you, we're a little bit biased bacteriologists. We focus on 60 nests, but you can do this with viruses. You can do it with fungi. The sky's the limit. You amplify your DNA, you sequence it, and you've all these reads. Now, in the past, we would have used BLAST. And that's still an entryway for most faculty, right? You get your colonies, you do your boil prep, you do the, the, the Sanger sequencing, and then you can blast your sequence. And so there's no limit there. Anyone, anyone can frankly do that. It's just going to be the money, the money that you have available to you. And for many of us, we use Chime, right? But even Chime can be difficult for a lot, for a lot of faculty. Um, so when you start thinking about the, the design of your experiment, you'll be thinking about what you're going to do, what kind of sample you're going to have, your DNA and your, and your RNA isolation, how you're going to sequence it, and how you're going to process it. And so this is all something you have to consider when you're trying to bring bioinformatics into your classroom. Um, but as again, it tackles a lot of these skills that we want our students to get from quantitative literacy to data literacy to scientific uh, literacy and um, how to read papers, etc. And so you can be very strategic in how you design your class. So this is one thing I want to say is that for many of us, the idea of doing bioinformatics in classrooms, just, it's expensive, right? So to go out and sequence things is expensive. I don't have the money. And that's that's how many of us start. So that's where I always say bioinformatics. You can do this without it won't cost you any money. Um, so there's tons of readings out there, and I'm going to give a plug to my colleague, Carla Scholar, who I know you all know at Brumar. He actually developed case studies that brought in high throughput data analysis. And um, there's also studies, case studies at the NSTA, and there's loads of lovely readings out there that you can bring into your classroom to get students started on their journey to learning, learning about the microbiome. And this is one I really like. We are not alone. The unseen world of the microbiome. So it's a great way to kind of build your story around what you're going to teach the students with respect to the microbiome. So Remnet, we have all the resources that you could possibly need, right? We're working on it all the time. We have journals where we've annotated, we have tutorials, and we have tutorials on things like how to analyze your data with R and how to analyze your data with Excel and how to go beyond, right? How to analyze with Nefeli and everything else. We have webinars, as Sean alluded to, and we will be offering another set of webinars in the fall, around usually around October, November time. And um, we started to bring in MinIon sequencing as well, because a lot of you are asking for MinIon, and we're developing MinIon protocols ourselves in the lab. But we have all these resources available for you. And as I said, the workshop will be in the fall. And our, our work, workshop tutorials are actually, we record everything. 
So they go onto YouTube and they're freely available to anyone. So if you want to, you know, just follow along, pause, stop and, and learn as you go, it's very easy and very accessible for most everybody. So highly recommend that you check these out. You don't have to register if you don't have the money. It'll be available on YouTube and we, we put everything up there. So what about course design? Engaging impactful cures. So cures, classroom undergrad research experiences with bioinformatics. So this is what it would kind of look like for us, right? So generally you start off with your students developing a research question. It could be anything, right? So I want to know what's on the elevator buttons. So I want to know what's on the vending machines, or I want to go across to the development that where they're building the new building over there. I want to look at what's happening with the soil diversity as, as they progress through the, through the building. So this is kind of a standard course design. And what we're saying here is it's modular. So depending on what you have available to you, you might use data that's already been published. You might download a data set from, from GenBank, or you might simply just do the PCR and the 60 nest sequencing with Sanger. It doesn't really matter. Basically, you're kind of bringing them on this journey. And what you're hoping for is it'll lead to presentations of some description where the students will present in their work and share it to their peers. We've also got uh, suppliers and vendors and information on, on costing for these kinds of experiences. So we're trying to kind of reduce the limits, reduce the barriers, make sure that anyone can jump onto this and get going with a microbiome research project. And as I said to you before, you can explore your own data, but there's always data that somebody else generated. And we have existing data sets on soil, on water, and other things that you can use. And we're trying to work with our network, Sean included, to get more faculty to kind of share with us. Here's the metadata that goes with this data set. And here's the story. And here's why we did this. So we can have more access for more people to get involved with microbiomes. So again, with microbiomes, you're not going to be doing blast. You're going to be using some sort of a tool, usually Chime. The Chime itself can be hard for a lot of faculty, particularly if you've not had any bioinformatics skills before. If, if you don't know how to use command line, et cetera, it can be tricky. And you may not have access to computers that would actually facilitate using Chime, because Chime is memory intensive, right? So one of the things we've started to use now is Nefeli. So Nefeli, if you've never heard of Nefeli, this is an open source, freely available tool that's available to anyone who wants to do microbiome work run by the NIH. Um, they're very cool. They're very open to questions if you ever need help from them, but they have pipelines for everything. So in this tool, you can basically pre-process your reads. You can choose the analysis that you want to do, chime or otherwise. And then lastly, you can explore the data. So you can actually explore it and you can go beyond that. You can look at PyCrust and other, other tools to kind of really get to grips with what the patterns that you're seeing in your data. So we highly recommend this. And even more recently, they've developed uh, metagenomic and pipelines, and you can do SARS-CoV-2 sequencing with it, should you wish to. They're also working on um, MinEye and sequencing pipelines as well. So if you want to use MinEye, they're getting ready for that too. And as I said before, our channel has all of the um, analysis with Nefeli ready to go. So from day one, we do about four sessions each, each year. We do this, and in each session, we go through Nefeli, we kind of build you through, walk you through it as we go. And at the last sessions, we generally customize it to what the um, participants want to see. So depending what you all need to ask for, there's likely going to be something in there. We also do some nice workshops with just bar charts, just making bar charts and making you know, heat maps and things like this with even just the simplest of Excel spreadsheets that show you how to look at the data and what you got from your microbiome analysis. So the nice thing about it, is there's no coding experience necessary, right? You don't need to be necessarily a, a programmer to do this. It's free, you use the cloud. So you don't have to have a, a fancy computer or an access to a cluster, say. Um, and as I said, there's loads of support and tutorials available for you as well. Um, as I mentioned, you can use uh, Amplicon metagenomes, shotgun metagenomes. Another really nice thing about it is they actually provide you with data sets that will get you started. So if you're, if you're not sure what to do, you can just walk through with sample data sets and that will help you just kind of get to grips with it. And as I mentioned before, we're working on kind of student friendly manuals that go along with this. So we've used this in our classes. We've used it with our students. Um, and so if our students can do it and we can do it, then we can actually get to grips with the analysis in class. And we've done it, as I said, um, with all different kind of levels of students. So from freshmen all the way up to, to college age students and even um, high school students. So oftentimes we have high school students in the laboratory and they can use Nefeli with, with little or no help from us, frankly. So when you're doing all this, you have to be thinking to yourself, well, what kinds of things can I do, right? So Davida, you've talked about this remnant thing. What, what can you do? 
So here's a couple of examples from st studies that I've done with my students in my class. And the first one I'll talk to you about is Superfund sites. If, if any of you are familiar with Superfund sites, these are highly, highly contaminated sites, usually in low income neighborhoods and oftentimes only getting better because of gentrification, frankly. And um, people often use these as recreation sites. They, they have no idea what's going on. And when I moved to Texas, um, the first thing I did was I looked up all the Superfund sites so I could go there and start sampling, right? Um, but Superfund sites, as I said, highly contaminated, but often a great source of really interesting and diverse microbes because of the nature of the pollutants that are there. So I found highly resistant bugs in these Superfund sites, resistant to everything, frankly, from antibiotics up to heavy metals. So we developed a study. This is something we did with a class. We looked at four different sites on two Superfund sites that lived in New York City, right? The Gowanus Canal, Newton Creek. And there's a bunch of educators in New York and we're all working on Gowanus Canal, Newton Creek because they're, they're super interesting. Most of our students live right by the Gowanus Canal and Newton Creek. We also did it over a period of a year. So each year we would take a sample and that's something you could do with classes. So you go out, you take a sample in the fall, take a sample in the spring, summer and, and, and fall again. And you can have a lovely temporal data set and students are always contributing to the data set over time. So you can compare year to year and look at the impacts of weather and other factors, right? And so this is an example of the data. So this is, again, these are microbes, look at the microbes. And again, I'm trying to teach the students microbiology at the same time. So historically, I would have shown them a bunch of, of um, trees, dichotomous trees to help them understand how microbes are related to one another. I don't have to do that now because I can use sequencing data. And the neat thing about this is, as I mentioned before, you can look at fall, spring, summer, you can look at temporal data, and then you can look at different types of sites. So the, the super fun sites are what we classify as brackish water, salty-ish water on a concentration gradient. But we also compared these to um, sites from a freshwater system, which was called Greenwood Cemetery. We took samples from Greenwood in the same, we actually did everything on the same day. So it was a big undertaking. We went out, got all the samples and we sequenced them. And we looked at relative abundance. It's very simple with the students. And you can see that in the freshwater sites, actinobacteria, which are generally considered to be friendly, happy-go-lucky microbes to make soil antibiotics and such, were high, highly abundant in the freshwater sites. Whereas the poopy bacteria, which I personally like to study, they were highly prevalent in the Superfund sites. And this is not ex un un unexpected. It's not. But when you think about it, when we do these kinds of things with microbiology, we often stop at E. coli. <laughs> there's E. coli in the water, right? There's fecal coliforms or there's E. coli in the water. You might do a most, most probable number. In this si in situation, you get huge amounts of diversity back from the data set. And they can see it's not just E. coli, it's not just gram negatives, it's alpha proteobacteria, it's gamma proteobacteria. And you can drill down to genus, not quite the species, but you can drill down to species, the genus level, and see what kinds of microbes are present and try and identify hypotheses as to why they may or may not be there. Right. That's the first one. The second study is the microbiome of the built environment. So again, remember, when I got to my academic career, I had to move away from pathogens into kind of less scary bugs because I didn't want to be handling human samples. Right. So with this one, I designed a study whereby we looked at with my students, we looked at a building. This building here on the left hand side was the residence hall. It had just been built. It had just been built. And on the right hand side, we had our campus where the students took their classes right across the street from one another. So we went in and we sampled the building that was new and we sampled the building that was old, right? And our hypothesis there was the building where the students were living was like a baby. It's like a neonatal microbiome. There weren't going to be any microbes there, surely, to, surely not. And then when they're, where, the school, where the students were dirty, nasty, full of, you know, um, human microbes, et cetera, et cetera. And so we did what we do. We went in with hard hats and we sampled all the surfaces, brought it into the class, used Kaijin kits and everything else to isolate DNA, ran it on our computer and did our analysis. Similarly, I had the students do, because remember, I'm a microbiology instructor. We did contact agar plates as well. The contact agar plates were selective for resistant bacteria. And I'm teaching the students that, yes, there's bacteria there, but also there's resistant bacteria there. Remember, resistant bacteria are everywhere. They're not just in the hospitals, they're everywhere. So we isolated those as well. And what did we find? We were trying to figure out what bacteria were there that were dead. So the thing about the microbiome is it's kind of limiting. You're only getting dead bacteria back. But with using viable counts and looking for bacteria, you can see the live ones too. And you can kind of you know, measure both against each other and see, did the, did, the, did the results agree with one another? But this was one of my favorite findings. So 
I've studied staff forever, right? For, from when I was a, a, doing my PhD student, PhD back in Trinity College in Dublin. Um, but this is one of the things that jumped out at us, right? So before is an orange, blue is an after, one week in the, di in the difference between these samples, right? Um, our, this is streptococcus. So for those who aren't microbiologists, strep is usually found in your th throat, in your nasopharynx, right? And I never thought about how much strep there would be living on surface. Strep is kind of a nasty bug, right? Um, but as you can see, before the students moved in, there was a little bit of strep depending on the surface that we went after. But after the students moved in, one week, just one week later, it was highly abundant. And this kind of, you know, gets the students to understand that we as humans, we're having a huge impact on the ecosystems that we inhabit. Before we're there, it's different. And then after we move in, it's changed. So we have an impact on our environment and on our ecosystem. And it's lingering. It doesn't necessarily go away. So these are just two examples of what you can do. And depending on the nature of what you're working with and the types of students that you have, um, you can devise really interesting projects. And the neat thing about it then is that they can become very creative, right? And that's what I love. So seeing my students develop posters, I don't have them print the posters. We don't have the money, frankly. I have them do online digital poster sessions and you can present them on the, on the screen, right? Or I've used Padlet. So if you don't know about Padlet, it's a free tool where you basically can uh, have a, a, an online, like a gallery of posters. And I have my students sometimes record videos and they can comment on each other's posters. And then if they get super creative, they'll actually draw the class in microbe form, which is down here on the, on the right-hand side. This is all the members of the microbiome team that year. So you're basically, there's a lot of things you can do with this um, and ensure that you're reaching all of your curriculum goals while teaching them microbiomes and bioinformatics. So Remnant is a big community. And as you can see, we're pretty much spread everywhere. We're always looking for new members. So if you have a moment right now, scan this QR code. It will bring you to our website, Microbiomes for All. And we'd love to see you at a future Remnant meeting. As I said, Sean, I met Sean through Remnant and I have been longtime friends with him. And he's doing incredible work at Warburg, along with all the Remnant faculty across the country. Um, bioinformatics is a great way to get students engaged with science. And oftentimes you can start slow and build up to some of the talks that you're going to see later on this afternoon with the other presenters. And so I'm going to thank my colleagues from Remnet, Avram Kaplan, uh, Gina Sampagna, and Theo, who is Theo Moot, who's the PI of this grant. And I am looking forward to answering all and any of your questions. Thank you very much. Excellent. <clears throat> thank you, Davida. Um, Getting lots of claps, I see. That's great. Uh, so I we do have a few questions that were in the chat, um, but I'd like to start off. You mentioned Minion and the fact that <clears throat> Nefeli is coming out. I thought I saw just recently that they have yes. a, yeah, uh, a version that will actually work with the Minion sequencer. Yes, they do. And so we've, we've been waiting for the longest time. So like last year, a lot of folks from Remnet, from the workshops we would go to, the faculty had had access to Minion. They'd gotten them through grants or they'd gotten them through kind of end of semester um, budgetary whatever's um, and at the time there was no there was no way easy way to to analyze uh, nanopore data but now now they do and so we're we're hoping that and certainly by fall that we will have what, like what we do for Nefeli we will have it ready for Minion data as well and we encourage you all and um, this one piece of advice that I always give you if you're ever starting something talk to the companies before you commit because as of right now, um, Nanopore and Minion, they're, they're changing everything. And so they're actually going to be um, getting rid of the MK1C and other uh, aspects of the chemistry. So I don't want you to commit to anything just yet. Maybe hold on for a while, see what's happening with their, their new platforms. The flongles are good, but they're changing everything else. So don't invest just yet. Talk to the company and see what's happening before you do. Any other right. questions? Yep. So Emily Mills uh, uh, asked, uh, She's playing with bacteriophages, or they're playing with bacteriophages uh, with students this semester. Is there support for phage genomes? Do you know, um, I don't uh, I don't actually think there is directly support for phage genomes, but there would be through the, um, let me see, through the metagenome analysis aspect of it. So if you were going to generate libraries, um, you could use the shotgun metagenomics pipeline for sure. Um, but for phage genomes, I would highly recommend that you would look into Galaxy. Um, so Galaxy has a lovely set of uh, pipelines and tutorials for analyzing phage genomes. In fact, if you write to me, I will connect you with a link and I'll show you what's going on there. Galaxy is very similar. It's very, very user friendly and they have great support um, for faculty who want to do this kind of thing as well. Yeah, to, to piggyback on that, I've, I've 
tried to put together a genome with Galaxy in it. And it, it, they do have nice um, uh, protocols for you. So I will second that. Um, let's see, Carolyn uh, asked, how large of a class do you typically work with? Um, yes, that's that's fair, Carolyn. Um, so I've I usually at the new school I was very lucky. My classes were you know between twelve and eighteen. I think the largest microbiology class I would ever have at a time is twenty four because of the size of the labs, because I do these classes in labs, right? Um, but the nice thing about uh, Nefeli and other types of tools like this is that they do very nicely translate to larger classes. So most of the faculty in Remnet are dealing with much larger classes than I would necessarily have. Um, and so teaching via um, uh, online tools becomes more, uh, to be honest with you, a little bit more feasible. One of the things I've done, though, is I've always I try to recruit a student, a peer mentor. And I would give you that piece of advice, if at all you can. If you have a student in your research lab, someone who's taking your class, recruit them or a couple of students and have them be, if you can, TAs, see if you can do true work study and so on and so forth, because they will actually be the best to be honest with you, they'd be the best TAs that you can possibly have because they're near peers to the students um, and they can often answer questions that you can't if you can't be around. So bioinformatics classes are just like lab classes. You have to be able to get to all the students because oftentimes it's a colon or a comma or something that's just holding them up and they can't continue the class or they can't find out where the files are. And um, this is this is something I would I would recommend. Right next is Josie. Uh, your study on the Brooklyn Superfund sites is so interesting. Will it be published? Do you have data on New York City sewage pathways to overlay? Oh, that's, uh, brilliant. <laughs> that's, that's brilliant. That's brilliant. Yes, Josie, do you know something? I did that work. I, I have those samples still in the fridge. And to be honest with you, I've been waiting until I had access to um, real time for resistance genes. That was the only thing I wanted to do. Um, and if I don't know if any of you know this, but I was involved in the New York uh, wastewater surveillance for COVID. Um, I do want to go back and kind of look at what's in the in the in the wastewater sites and kind of look at what's going on in the in the Superfund sites. Um, will I publish it? I really hope to. In fact, I wanted what I really want to do is I want to publish it as a resource for for faculty to to teach with. Um, using the story of the Superfund sites as kind of background information for the for it. Um, I just haven't had the time, frankly. But um, I'm happy to share the share the files with you if you want. No problem. Daniel asks if you tried to reach out to Nanopore to see if they have interest in like funding that type of class or this type of class. <laughs> have I ever? I oh, I'm shameless and asking for money. No, no, I like seriously. Um, what I will tell you all, I don't know if you all know this, but Nanopore originally was a UK based uh, oh. company and they were quite difficult to deal with, frankly. The supporting documentation for Nanopore is also very difficult to read. If you're used to that Illumina kits, um, that's tricky. Um, they are now being supplied by VWR. So if, if those of you are in the States, you can get your stuff through VWR. And I would highly recommend that you talk to your rep. Your rep will be, especially if you're at a HSI or a community college or resource limited school, your reps will often throw you a bone, right? Another thing is that uh, Nanopore have grants. They're actually offering grants and kind of fellowships and things for faculty who want to do things. I think they're, they're like about a thousand dollars or something like this, but it would get you started for sure. Um, because the kits, the kits are expensive, right? Let's be honest, everything's expensive. Um, but I highly recommend talking to rep first, talk to v VWR, see if they'll give you a bone and then work with, they'll have a technical specialist from Nanopore and they will often be very nicely with respect to quotes. Do not, that's the one piece of advice I give to everybody. Always talk to the reps. Don't buy anything this price. You never have to. They'll often give it to you. Sometimes they'll also give you stuff that's nearing the end of its its um, usage, right? So something is close to expiration or expired. Remember for classes, it doesn't matter, right? If the, if the kit's old, it doesn't matter to us. We will use it. I don't care. <laughs> um, so take, keep that in mind as well. Awesome. Um, Christina is wondering about, is curious about a budget for extraction kits for a class of 24 approximately. Yeah, so it um, depends on the kit you're using, right? So on Remnet, I actually didn't include the slides, but I have a another QR code and a, and a, a spreadsheet that has kits and all the usual list prices for them. And as remember what I told you, you're going to talk to the, to the reps. Um, but a, an average kit for about 24 samples, a Kaijin kit is about $500, but Zymo and other kits are much less, about $300. So look at Zymo, they're a great company yeah. and they have a lot of affordable stuff. I've, got, I've gotten the Zymo kits before and you can get 50 reactions for less than $300. That's it. That's so it. that works well. Uh, let's see. Um, Bryce uh, says that he's had some good luck getting free stuff, 
free stuff from Oxford Nanopore through a rep, but only after he made an initial investment of a couple starter kits. Well, here's where I'm telling you to be strategic. Remember I said that's the most important advice I can give you. If you do this through your classes, so here's where it happened. When I was first a faculty member, I didn't have any startup funds. I, I really had to hustle, right? So the way that I did it is by integrating my own research into the classes meant that I could generate preliminary data in my classes and I could get the materials for the class through the class fee or through the lab fee for the class, right? So oftentimes if you talk to your department chair and you say, I'm going to do this in four sections of microbiology, it'll impact all of these students. These are the outcomes I anticipate. Can you help me with some seed fund funding? They'll often buy you some, at least some devices get you started, right? So this is what I'm saying. If you can make it to be tied to curriculum, so it's not just your section, your class, and um, that's how you can do it, right? That's really important. Any of you, isn't it? Ooh, I didn't know that. Thank you, yeah. Anne, for sharing. Um, Promega yeah. are wonderful, by the way. Promega are wonderful. They're not on the radar mm -hmm. for most people, um, and they will often throw you a bone with respect to kits. They just want to see efficacy. They want to see if it's useful. And um, they're very, very nice to work with. And um, they've given me a lot of, of a lot of free stuff, frankly. And um, so talk to the Promega reps as well. Yeah. And, if, and for sequencing, you can, there's a few companies out there that'll, uh, you know, do a little bit of a discount for you if you're education as well. That's right. Uh -huh. And also like even Zymo will offer you 10% off and such. So highly recommend ever, if ever you guys go to conferences or your, your, professional societies always go up and talk to the reps when you're there they'll often have coupons that they'll give you like 10 percent off and um, i also have remnant has a list of sequencing services as well they're not super inexpensive but to be honest sometimes it's cheaper to just send it out and if you if you send out make sure you're sending out samples that will benefit you frankly so if you were trying to especially your faculty member try and get the best samples to send out that you can use then for grants into at your institution or nsf grants and so on and so forth so just again always say to yourself Talk to rep, be strategic. Don't don't waste any resources because we don't have many. Yeah. Adina has a question. Uh, how do you emphasize re reproducibility clarity with bioinformatic methods when using uh, graphical user interfaces or pre-made pipelines? What are your suggestions about making the data analysis tool choices more transparent? Um, yeah, that's a great question. I mean, like we we actually talk about this when we go into it in more detail for from it from both ends right from reproducibility of your analysis to reproducibility of the, the sample and not ensuring that you don't have any contaminants in there and everything else i mean let's be honest um for us we often don't have a lot of time for iterative anything in classes right we have like one day to do one thing um, but what I have done before is with um, things like where I have opportunity to do modeling and things I can let the students do simulations and run things a bunch of times and just show them that it's the same, it's going to be different. There is a stochastic element to this, right? Um, but also just, I think talking to them about quality control, quality, data management, um, you know, the idea of reproducibility when it comes to taking a sample, the variation in, in a given sample. So my class this year, just to give you an example, we're doing soil. And so I've had the students work in teams, trying to save money again, but having the students work in teams, when you take a single sample, you're not going to, you know, you'll get diversity, sure, but you don't know if it's one off. So I had my students think about this and I suggested that we take four samples within a small, you know, geographical area. And then we compare across samples. Each team has their own site. And so there's six teams. And then they can compare between teams. And it's just to kind of give them a sense of the variation that you have within a site and then the variation you have across sites. So that's that's one thing you can do. And um, as regards uh, GUIs, I have, I couldn't tell you. I really couldn't tell you there. So I, I don't really have students do that at all. And um, hope that helps. <laughs> yeah, Mr. Dean. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, we, we had a question about microbiome sequencing. I've used Seek Coast recently, but then also Mr. DNA has been good in the past. Mr. DNA is great, right labs. We have great success with right labs. They're, they're a collaborator with um, um, Remnet. I think they're about fifty dollars, but there are other places that are cheaper. And one of the things, you know, something, and Sean, Sean, Sean will know. I've been trying to do these kinds of things for a while, but if we could ever get to a point where we had a a bunch of us faculty agree to sequence together, and um, if we were to do that, sign a memo and say all of us will will give you ten samples this semester. Can you give us batch price sequencing across campuses? And that's something I've I've wanted to do for a long time. So. I think if all of us committed, you know, I'll give you 10, I'll give you 10. And we all did it as part of a, of a project. We might be able to get even cheaper pricing because that's often what they want to do. They just want to fill, they want to fill a place, right? And so 
if they can't fill a plate with one set of samples, if we all coordinate it, use these barcodes, I'll use those barcodes, you know, that's another way we could do it. Um, but we just have to be, again, super strategic in that situation. But um, it is getting cheaper. It is getting cheaper. So it's just not super cheap yet, but it's getting there. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much, Davida. Um, I think we've reached the end of our time uh, for this talk, and we'll move on to the next talk. So I think April will be introducing our next speaker. And again, Davida, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Wonderful talk. Okay, I am happy to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Philip Campo, who is a teaching professor at Carnegie Mellon University in the Computational Biology Department. Dr. Campo is really a pioneer in online bioinformatics education. He's involved in creating um, many freely available programs such as Rosalind, Biological Modeling, and Programming for Lovers. In addition to his online education efforts, he's also um, developed many in-person courses for both or for high school, undergraduate, and graduate levels. His dedication to teaching has won him many prestigious awards, such as the Herbert Simon Award for Teaching Excellence in Computer Science. And with that, I would like to pass it off to Dr. Campo. April, thank you for the very kind introduction. I really appreciate that. Um, and Davida, that was an excellent talk. So I, that really got me excited. Um, so I'm I'm also easy to find on LinkedIn and Twitter, but don't don't go to Twitter. It's not a good place. But I'd be happy to connect with you. Um, and if you have any questions after this talk, I'm I'm easy to find. So please feel free to reach out, out to me. As April mentioned, I'm from the computational biology department in the Carnegie Mellon University School of Computer Science. So at CMU, we're divided into schools based off discipline, and we have an entire school with seven departments, one of which is computational biology. I technically need to change my slides here because uh, we were recently received a $25 million gift. So we're now the Ray and Stephanie Lane computational biology department. So I've got to make sure I say that and I'll also update all my icons, but I was a little lazy on that and I didn't update it. I want to take the opportunity to talk to you about a course that I had a chance to co-design five years ago that we teach to first year undergraduates. And I think at least the last time I checked, so feel free to correct me, that we have the really a unique course in terms of having a first-year undergraduate course designed to teach computational biology from day one. And as I mentioned, I'll, I'll talk about a little about how the course runs, what the big picture themes of it are, the types of topics that it covers, et cetera. As, as I mentioned, we're currently in year six of running the course. And this is taken by students in different colleges at our university, but the primary focus is for undergraduates in the School of Computer Science. And so it's designed as a first year course, students who are not first years and from outside the school also take it. But we have a very selective, which can work both ways, a very selective school. Um, so we have, it's actually lower than 5%, it's usually now, uh, below 4% acceptance rate to our school. So students at CMU apply to the school that they're interested in instead of just the university as a whole. And so we wind up having this immensely selective school and unbelievable collection of students. One of the things that is nice about that is that it means that we can rely on the core education that is provided to students as a result of being school of computer science students. And so they go through a uh, mathematics and computer science car mental car wash that starts on day one of their education. And we know that they take a very rigorous one semester introduction to programming in their first semester. Even if they've had programming before, they are going, going to take a, an introductory programming course. And they also take an introduction to proofs course that has a focus on discrete mathematics. And that's a course that I took, I took it early as a sophomore mathematics major at my own undergraduate institution. And this is something that all of our students take first semester. So that is nice because much of what I want to teach relies upon hoping that the students know how to program and hoping that they can start to understand discrete structures because they're everywhere in biology. We use this course as the gateway to our major in computational biology. And I 
have a talk on YouTube and could talk at length about just that undergraduate program that we have built, which is one of five majors that are available to students in our school. How we have constructed this is we always use th this honeycomb graphic to explain that we feel like we're at the intersection of all this core knowledge where we're pulling disciplinary information from different disciplines in an interdisciplinary field. So like I've already mentioned that in a first year course, we can trust that students have programming background and discrete mathematics background. And so some of our more advanced courses will be able to assume that students have had a couple of biology courses and a machine learning course and a statistics course and matrix algebra. So our genomics course, for example, is basically taught at a PhD level for that reason, um, because it, we, we were fortunate enough to be able to construct the, the curriculum for our major in this way. Um, the benefit too is that we don't just have a computational biology major, which at a lot of places, students don't necessarily get exposed to bioinformatics until say their juniors or senior year, we get them on the ground running in their first spring. Um, the course has several like big picture aims, and they all come from the, the central premise that we want to show students what are the great ideas that have made biology into a computational discipline. So it's called great ideas in computational biology with that as the mindset. And we have sort of different sub aims associated with that as we go. Um, one of the things is that it's ultimately we're teaching a course that's computational. And one of the things that we want students to appreciate, even if they're not computational biology majors, but they're taking it as an elective, is that fundamental algorithmic topics like expectation maximization, dynamic programming, these things that computer scientists learn have been used repeatedly throughout computational biology. We'll see each of these topics several times as we go. We also try to establish this broad view of computational biology to find fantastic topics that are outside of the standard things that we cover. I'm going to talk about specifics of our curriculum here momentarily. We also try to look at topics that have arisen from biology, things like algorithms for sequence alignment or uh, algorithms involving, say, uh, the burroughs wheeler transform or things like this that are actually so fundamental that they have informed non-biological topics of computer science that students who are not computational biology majors would see in their computer science core coursework downstream of us, but that actually arose from a biological context. At every moment of the course, we're always pointing students towards primary research with the idea that at some point in time, a lot of these ideas are new. And none of them are really that old because we ultimately have a field that's relatively new, which is nice. You can say, here is the paper that all these ideas came from. Um, we require students to complete a group project on a topic of their co of their choice. That's an, an, a very integral part of what we do. And the final point is that we always want to connect just the theory to practical applications. So we understand that we're still ultimately in a science and I'm teaching very theoretical ideas and it's very algorithmic focused, but I always then hand that off to practical applications so that students can see what they're doing on a real data set. Much of our course is taken from two textbook pro projects that um, one of which April mentions there on the right, Biological Modeling a Short Tour. The other, which I'd say a little over half of the course is taken from is Bioinformatics Algorithms and Active Learning Approach. I've got the print version here if it doesn't blur out. So the it does exist, I promise. But we also have an interactive version of this text that has dozens of autograded code challenges directly embedded into it and operates off the premise that students can, they have like just in time, a just in time approach. So students learn a little about the algorithms and then they have a homework assignment that allows them to actually get their hands dirty implementing those algorithms in one of a variety of languages and then get feedback on what they do. Um, this is the same product that we actually have used in our successful courses on Coursera for the last uh, 10 plus years. Um, the course is divided into two halves before and after spring break and what we look at is like classic fundamental genomics topics in the first half of the class. So we look at, and and we do a little bit of metagenomics here, uh, although it's in a couple of recitations. So it's it's present, but um, one of the things that we focus on is a genome assembly. And then we guide, that's where we start. And then we guide students up through, then once we have a genome, what are the types of questions that we can ask? You know, how do we find sequence motifs? How do we align things? How do we build evolutionary trees? How do we map reads once we have an existing genome and, and we have something that we know is going to be similar? How do we map sequencing reads to that? And so students see all these sort of um, fundamental ideas. And as I cover everything, I point students to the paper, some of which have tens of thousands of citations that all this is built upon. 
in the second half, I actually, and the students report this too, even though the first half is built off this project I've been working on for 11 years, the second half I enjoy more and sometimes they enjoy it more too, because we take this kind of big picture view of what computational biology ultimately is. It is very bio, like genomics is important, but there are things like a neural network is ultimately a biological construct. Um, we can look at an entire field of natural algorithms, algorithms that have evolved from within the context of nature, for example, from uh, things like ant forging that you'll probably know about to other things that I hadn't heard about until I started teaching this course, like looking at how uh, the Drosophila olfactory system solves like in problems very intelligently um, and actually more intelligently in, a, in an approximate way than existing algorithms were being solved. Um, so we, we take students through these sort of other directions in, bio, in computational biology. So they appreciate the breadth of our growing field. Um, I will mention that students actually, I had mentioned this before, but here are some specific topics of things that students cover in just general CS core coursework, whether it's the mathematical foundations for CS course, that discrete math course that everyone takes, or the sort of the intermediate programming course that all our first year students take. And in these courses, they see things like induction or pigeonhole principle or Euler's theorem, binary search, hash tables, et cetera, et cetera. But they're not necessarily covered with respect to an application. And so a lot of the computer science students are like, oh my God, I can't believe there's actually an application for this other stuff that we were learning. And not only that, but it's coming from biology which to these students is extremely surprising. Um, I'll say a little more about that in a second. Um, we also added, started to add these practical challenges. Remember I said one of the critical aims of the course is to point students towards primary research and show them the papers that this has come from and cite everything. And as part of that, we try to include practical applications. As the pandemic arose, I realized this was sort of a, a perfect opportunity to show a current event that was very heavily influenced by computational biology and that we were sequencing literally millions of viral genomes from patients. And we can do things like walk students through a galaxy pipeline where students apply spades to the SARS-CoV-2 genome and assemble it. So they learn about the DeBrown graph, this fundamental bioinformatics algorithms topic, and then they see it in practice when applying it to assemble the genome. And then we annotate, we build evolutionary trees. The students themselves identify the variants um, so we, we we're capturing the data as we go, and they'll as they build these evolutionary trees, they'll notice by building these and constructing multiple alignments, hey, something is new here. And so they get their hands dirty and are able to actually identify what these variants are genomically. Um, and then we look at like a, a protein structural comparison too, since that's an important downstream analysis of this. A quarter of the student's grade comes from a final project, and this is something that I would say I was hesitant about adding to a first year course. I, I We have theory homeworks, we have students implementing like a couple dozen coding challenges. Um, and I, I really push students in this course. But in lieu of doing a final exam, I, I decided to have a final project instead. And I didn't know how that was going to go. But having seen the results of this, it was it's been the right decision and students have responded really, really well to it. Um, the idea is that we live in an exciting era. There was a time when data was so closed and there's more and more open data available every day. So the directions that students can take with their project is uh, ever increasing. And because we take this broad view, students can kind of do anything in the field of biology plus data. Um, and they have to produce both a written essay to explain what they've done to an audience of their peers. And then we have final presentations as well. I should add one of the things that I have changed about it over the past couple of years is that uh, I used to make these projects open-ended and students would propose and then try and execute, pro I wouldn't let them execute them, but they would at least propose projects that were like, we're going to look at 300 microbiome papers and try and do this giant meta-analysis, or we're going to build a complete working map model of the bacterial cell. And I'm like, that would need $20 million of funding. You know, that is an unsolved problem uh, for larger bacteria. Um, but once I've gotten them on rails, they've produced some amazing uh, little projects, everything from uh, looking at, say, a, a standard sort of image-based breast cancer diagnosis pipeline using neural networks, um, to actually I've got a metagenomics project here where they looked at quantifying the stability of different distance metrics and similarity scores. So 
you, you have a whole family of different ways of representing differences between samples. They don't necessarily always agree. Can we quantify that and understand that? I mean, that's a very deep project, I think, for a first year student. Um, and then looking at things like spreading of disease, SARS-CoV-2 has obviously been popular, but we had a flu project too. Um, one of the things, uh, the issue, some, one of the things I just mentioned that I'm proud of uh, doing is when we moved towards a, a remote class in 2021, we, you know, in 2020, we were kind of caught off guard by everything. But in 2021, we knew we were going to have a fully remote class. And I know that one of the things I noticed that fall was the sort of and this is not an indictment of anybody on this call because I, I love having camera off, but in a classroom, how difficult it was as instructors to look up and just see dark rectangles with student names. And so we, we I think we did some cool things. I've got a, a blog post on my website about trying to boost engagement of that. So if we had perfect attendance in the class, there would be points that we would award um, and students would get um additional points for like a Hogwarts system where they were asking good questions. And then we converted all the points into donations to a local charity that the students chose. Um, so that was amazing that I could actually even see all of my students and expect them to show up to class during that time. As April mentioned, this won SCS's um, highest teaching award in 2022, which we were really proud of. Um, and then when we asked the students sort of you know, how is the class going for you? We've made some, a lot of changes here and there and a couple changes in terms of the curriculum based off of student feedback. But one of the things that they really appreciate is that uh, this is ultimately, and we have our own introduction to computational biology that's aimed for bio majors. And it has this covers the same types of topics, but uh, has a different lens. And so it, that is in part because we tried as hard as we could to have one course for our CS and computational biology students and one course for our biology students. And they just ultimately spoke different languages. And like, we can get those students together in other courses downstream, but we ultimately teach this course um, somewhat separately. And it's been nice to see that students respond to the idea that ultimately it is a, I feel like ultimately I am teaching a life sciences course. It is algorithmic and everything, but we are always thinking about the biology and complications and things like this. Sorry, if you can hear, I've got sirens and, uh, motorbikes and everything going on at my house. Um, but students appreciate seeing, hey, I learned about this topic in another course, but I can I can see something applied to a real practical problem. Um, a key point is that you don't actually have biology as a prereq. So I explain on day one, like literally what DNA is. And so every time we need a little bit of biology, I try to teach students what they need. And then as we go build up their intuition about how biology works. Um, I would also say, I'll point to my final quote here, um, because this is the type of thing that in talking to prospective students or talking to computer scientists in general, it's the type of thing that I see quite frequently, which is I will ask students, so who here hated their high school biology class? And it used to be that it would be like 90% of hands go up and things have gotten better. Like we're down to probably 80% of hands, something like that, and which resonates with me because when I took my high school biology class, I walked out of there having lost 10 pounds, vowing that I would never take a biology class ever again in my entire life. Unfortunately, this is the reality. Man, they're really loud. Unfortunately, this is the reality of what students get at the high school level that we, I feel like as life science oriented people, we have to fight against a little bit. And so it's nice that, um, even though I didn't convince this person to love biology, at least got them to like computational biology a little bit more and maybe started them on the type of path that I took after I walked out of that high school biology classroom. Um, I always will finish with some acknowledgements. Part of what makes my course work is that I've had absolutely stellar TAs over the past, I don't know why it says three years, um, over the past five years. And we had some TAs help me write these SARS-CoV-2 challenges that we actually have made public. So if you would like to, uh, use these in your own course. They're on my website. And that's one of the resources in addition to a full set of slides for the course that's available at my personal website, which is my last name, and then .cbd.cmu.edu. So feel free to reach out to me. As I said, I'd be happy to take any questions that you have. And I really thank you for your attention. I'm going to disappear for the next like 15 seconds so I can shut my window because we had a nice day in Pittsburgh, but I have an unbelievable amount of noise going on outside my house. Thank you.
Okay, so feel free to put any questions for Dr. Campo in the chat, and we have some there already. Uh, so the first question is, what kind of scaffolds do you use to guide student topic choice for the final project? Like considering that it may need to reflect their strengths and support their needs might vary. Good question. So student, we have a number of different deliverables as part of the project. Um, and, and I'd say this is a practice that I, I didn't exactly invent, but I, I try to use it in all my classes where we have projects. And we start students early with doing a proposal. Sometimes students in final projects in a class will not need to propose anything until much later in the semester. And our project presentations are going to be due here in another week. Uh, the project proposals are going to be due in the next week. So um, one of the, in terms of the rails, I expect about half of those, I give everybody sort of a green light, red light, or green light, yellow light. Um, and half the students are going to go to green light, half the students are going to have some yellow light associated with their project, whether it's, I told you that you're not going to be able to get 4,000 human genomes, but you you didn't listen to me and you tried to do a project that way, or your project is too broad, or your source of data is going to be difficult to get, or it's going to be too computationally intensive. Um, these I've seen enough projects over the years to sort of know the buckets where students can fall into pitfalls. And I warn them of that, but sometimes we still see issues with this. And normally that's the biggest issue is trying to make sure that we get students um, on a path where I can see that the future of their project is probably going to be bright. And I think having something that's aimed towards reproducibility in a first year project and not just leaving it completely open-ended has been really helpful in that regard so that they can see what other people have done. And if they, they feel intimidated, they can talk to TAs and get suggestions and pick the type of project where it's like they're using, the TAs can say, look, these tools are like publicly accessible and really easy to use and you can get started with demos and start to build their confidence that they're actually going to be able to uh, carry something out. So the next question is, um, there's little programming resources for biologists. So besides your books and courses, um, which they think are great, um, they can only think about Martin Jones' uh, Python 4 for biologists. So for an instructor who has little experience with programming for data analysis or bioinformatics, what would be the best route to learn to be able to teach an introductory course? Um. That's a great question. And one of the other courses that I teach is an introduction to programming for science oriented students. And I've taught that at the undergrad level in the past. Currently, we're teaching just a version for our master's students. But that's one of the material, the resources that I'm currently working on as like an online education initiative is a science oriented introductory course in programming that doesn't lose the any of the sort of rigor that we would expect in an introductory course for computer science students. And like, for example, you know, our our, um, our science interested students at, at CMU are very, very talented and go into a, a course that's designed for computer science students. And then they do prime numbers and graphics and um, very sort of CS nerd oriented things, and then they still do quite well. And I feel like at a lot of institutions, that's the case. Our, our standard education has gotten better and better, and our science students are getting stronger in math when they come in the door. And there's a huge opportunity there for universities to start offering like fully fledged introductory programming courses that just have a science flavor. So yeah, I can put that link in the chat. I'm building out a um, an open course that I'd love to have conversations with anybody who's interested in uh, potentially adopting this or working together. We currently teach it in the Go programming language, but we're going to be launching full language support for Python and Java here in 2024. Another question is, have you found that students' interests have evolved or changed over the past five years um, for the second course where you move beyond just classic algorithms? Oh, for the second half. Is that right, April? Yes. Yes, um, I think we've gotten relatively stable at this point. Um, but what I've noticed is students love the algorithms in nature component. And that's one thing that I used to have sort of a mini great ideas topic where we would talk about like a grab bag of different topics like graph algorithms for genome rearrangements or DNA computing. And, and 
students liked algorithms in nature so much that it's gotten a little bit bigger every every semester um, to where it's now like two full weeks. Uh, so what are the key ways that the intro um, computational biology course is um, or could be closer to the one that you described that was for the like biology um, students? So like what are key gaps in the biology background that students um, knowledge that you've observed um, and like ways that you could bridge those gaps? Are we talking about the two courses that we have at, at CMU? I believe so. I see. Yeah. Um, it's largely the the introductory comp bio course for biology students. Um, it, it sort of just speaks a different language. They do programming assignments, but the programming assignments are lighter. They have uh, the ability to apply things, to, but there's more of an applied focus. Our applications are largely like 30 or 40 minutes long as part of a recitation, but theirs might be like an entire homework assignment built around applying tools. Um, in terms of the background, it's it's that the, the biology students will have needed to have taken a programming course, um, but not a, a very intensive mathematics course at that point in their studies. Um, and that we don't assume any biology on our side. So that was part of the concern when teaching like a blended course is the students are, those student sets are strong, but because of their different backgrounds, somebody might ask a question that the biologists would like be rolling their eyes about, um, about background biology. And then part of the course is, is spent explaining that, which is not to say it's not a good question, but it's just arising because someone has that gap in their background of core biological information. Uh, so regarding when you mentioned about a student having a really negative um, like sense towards biology, um, what do you think drove that negative feelings? Was it like terminology or vocab? I think in my own case, it was an over-reliance on memorization and lack of sort of big understanding biology as a field that's been driven by extreme change at different points in time and, and shifts in how we view problems and, and that sort of thing. And I think, I mean, the only, <clears throat> the only molecular or, or cellular biology we really did in my own class, I remember printing out a, you know, we had to do worksheets on sort of the standard static model of the cell with like a cross section taken out of it. Um, but largely the rest of it, we just never covered anything. I mean, it, it was a shock to me when I got to later in my undergrad years and started learning about the realities of like what generating data from molecular biology labs actually means and what, what the frontier of the field is. And I think that that is unfortunately has gotten a lot better, but is the experience that students get in their high school biology classes is closer to what I have than what many of us would view as an ideal high school introduction to biology for students. Uh, what programs do you use um, to have your students build these evolutionary trees? Um, when we're looking at, is that for when we're looking at SARS-CoV-2? Yes. I assume is the, um, I think we use a couple different ones. Um, I think in the past, in the past, we've used mega, um, to run, you know, a, two or three different algorithms and sort of get the same output. Um, we usually run UPGMA because students implement it. I know it's not the best phylogenetic algorithm that there is, but it all often will give us some good results. And then I know that we apply Clustal uh, as well, because then we can get multiple alignments and students can visualize the multiple alignments with an MSA viewer and start to see how mutations are correlating and use that to start to understand how variants are arising or how to define them. And are you using ChatGPT in your classes at all? Am I using ChatGPT? I or have like having students use it. Or... Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we have in I've sort of updated my thinking on it. Um, I had a pretty strict no GPT allowed in the in the, my fall teaching. Although I think I I told students I was happy for them to use it to help revise their essays, um, especially because many of my students, at least in that course. Um, most are uh, not are English as a second language. So it's an immense opportunity for them to to help translate things that are difficult for them to express and these types of things. Um, I think it's a great ideas generator. 
as well as an editor. And so I suggest, I don't think it's good for generating text. I, I tell my students it will do terribly on producing an essay and I ban them from doing that. But I've started to suggest that my students use it to help them write tests for their code, as well as generate ideas for projects or um, help them debug. Okay, so we are um, right on time here. Thank you so much, Philip, for coming and speaking. Um, and everyone will take a five minute break. So please be back in five minutes. So at um, 345 Eastern time. Welcome back, everyone. Thank you so much for staying um, in the room. We really appreciate it. And so we're going to move directly into our lightning talks. Lightning talks are four minutes each. And each one of our presenters will share their screen at that time, unless we have your um, presentation. And we'll start right now with our first lightning talk. Rebecca, are you on the call? You can share your screen. Now I'll let you go and tell your say yes. your topic. Okay, great. Does everything look correct? Okay. So I just wanted to say thank you to everyone for organizing this and for sharing resources and being presenters today and also showing up. Um, today, I'm going to tell you about uh, doing a genome-wide association study in my developmental biology course at Baruch College. So here's just an example of a human genome-wide association study. So you see that you have polymorphisms across the entire genome, and you can look to see if you have a phenotype that you've measured. In this case, it's something about kidney stones. If there's any association between those polymorphisms and the phenotype you're interested in. Um, so I'm looking at hormone sensitivity in Drosophila melanogaster. Here's just an example of one polymorphism, right? So this would be a SNP where at the same location in the genome, you either have a G um, or a T. Um, and the idea would be that all of the in different iso uh, isolines that have the T would be more sensitive than the isolines that have the G. So the reason why this is possible to do in the undergraduate classroom is because different groups have sequenced all of the genome of 200 lines of um, isogenized flies. And so all of the lines are publicly available. You can order them in the mail um, and all the polymorphisms are available. So this is just what the website looks like and you can submit your data to the website and then it will spit out an analysis for you. Um, so this is what the data would look like that you would collect with your class. So you can order the lines from the Bloomington Stock Center. This is just the reference for the gene, for which isoline it is. And then your phenotype information, you know, the average of several assessments for each line. And you wanna pick something that would be accessible to the students. Here, we're looking at a type of blood cell that has an enzyme in it that makes them black after a brief heat shock. So this is just showing an example of the variation that you can find. This is when they have vehicle control and this is when they have hormone treatment. And so, on the left, you see the control, and on the right, you see um, after hormone treatment, and there's a dramatic change um, in the number of these cells. 
So once you get your polymorphisms back, they're aligned to the genome and you can visualize that using Genome Browser. So I spend a little bit of time teaching the students how to use the Genome Browser and what the different lines of evidence are using the GP modules, if you're familiar with that. Um, and so overall, we can determine if there's variation in hormone sensitivity using a variety of easily scored phenotypes, look for an association between the polymorphisms and the hormone sensitivity, then the following semester do a functional analysis using knockdown or overexpression, um, and then lastly, we can use Galaxy to see if there's any transcription factor binding sites that overlap with our associated polymorphisms. And these are some of the undergraduates who have worked with me over the years and resources from the community. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, the first lightning talk is hormone sensitivity, GWAS, in the undergraduate laboratory classroom. And so um, we now are going to move to, we're going to go directly following our schedule as it is printed. We're going to go to our second lightning talk. Could you please share your screen, Cole, and I'll let you do your title. Hello, everyone. So my name is Cole Davidson. I am an assistant professor of biology at Wartburg College. And my presentation is on decoding cancer, a dive into oncogenes and tumor suppressors using C BioPortal and Human Protein Atlas. So I implemented this project into my cell biology course last semester. I had 17 students. They ranged from sophomores to seniors and beyond, and they had varying backgrounds in bioinformatics as well as biology. So for this project, they were required to select a tumor suppressor or an oncogene. I provided a list of about 30 of them for, to, for them to pick from. And then they did a very short five minute PowerPoint presentation on their gene. For slide one, didn't even get into bioinformatics yet, but they had to provide information about the gene's function and a relevant cellular signaling pathway or a metabolic map on what was the purpose of their gene and that gene product. So here we can see an example presentation giving just a brief overview of P53, probably the most famous tumor suppressor ever studied. Then we started to use CBioPortal to use uh, publicly available databases and here we can see these alteration frequencies of the tumor suppressor P53 across various cancers. As we can see, the top hits were ovarian cancer, endometrial cancer, and non-small cell, uh, small cell lung cancer. So those were the three that most often had P53 dysregulated in some way. On the right, we can also see a survival curve, and this is for all cancers on C BioPortal. And it doesn't matter, you know, really which cancer is contributing the most here. As long as P53 was functional, we had a much better patient survivability in blue compared to patients in red who had P53 altered in some way. So that was using C BioPortal for gene analysis, but then I also wanted the students to leverage the Human Protein Atlas to look at protein expression. Now we can look at survival curves for specific cancers, such as endometrial cancer. Just like we saw with C BioPortal, the higher expression of P53 here in pink, the better the survival for the patients compared to in blue. The interesting part, and here's where the students start to appreciate the challenge and nuance, is that it's not always about expression, because here we see P53 expression in, um, excuse me, ovarian cancer, and here it's virtually the same. So this suggests not only do you have to consider about how much of the protein is being expressed, but also about the mutational status. So now we jump back to see BioPortal for their fourth slide, and then they can start to look at mutations. It's not surprising to see that P53 has a lot of different mutational sites that have been recorded. Here, students need to dive into the primary literature and find out how these mutations impact the function of the protein. Finally, they then needed a slide on a drug therapy that was relevant to their gene and protein. Here, students realized that if they picked an oncogene, they had a much easier time coming up with a treatment because most drugs are great at targeting and disrupting oncogene proteins. 
not so much of tumor suppressors, which are more experimental. And so this was their presentation. Just wanted to emphasize again that they were from all different backgrounds, sophomores through seniors. So this is just a very simple way to dip their toes into bioinformatics, into cancer biology, as well as precision-based medicine. So thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you all for coming. And thank you to my wonderful colleagues in attendance for your support. Thank you. Thank you so very much for a great lightning talk. We appreciate that. We're gonna move forward with lightning talk number three. Elizabeth, I'll allow you to share your screen. Thank you. <clears throat> Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes, the floor is yours. Perfect. Thank you so much for having me. I'm uh, speaking, you, speaking with you today from uh, the University of Calgary in Alberta, Canada, and I'm going to tell you about um, uh, our, our project here, incorporating the bioinformatic tool Benchlink to build connections between PCR theory and experimental results in an undergraduate lab. So here I'm describing a fairly simple um, lab module that we're using in a large second year undergraduate genetics course. It has lectures and weekly labs. Um, this is in the Department of Biological Sciences with students majoring in everything from biochemistry to zoology. And the goal of this particular module was to help students connect molecular theory from the lecture um, with experimental results. And this was in the context of sort of primers, PCR, and restriction mapping. So this um, experiment sort of gives students their very first taste of any type of bioinformatics. Um, and it also gives students some agency over the interpretation of their PCR results that they obtain in the lab. And this can be challenging um, given the number of students and sort of uh, limited time and, and resources. So this is a typical diagram um, explaining PCR that I might use in the lecture. Um, and students can find it hard, though, to connect with, with what PCR is, what, what's happening based on these, these colored rectangles. So the instructor preparation for this was fairly minimal. Um, in, uh, in this case, I designed primers for students ahead of time. Um, as a non-programmer, I used um, a simple tool, the STD Restriction Site Mapper, to design primers that amplified portions of genes with different numbers of restriction sites. So in our case, we had the enzyme band one handy. Um, I then generated a how-to guide and tutorial video to help students navigate Benchling, which is a free online sequence visualization platform. Um, in terms of the basic analyses we're doing here, other programs like, like SnapGene could be used uh, just as well. Um, but this particular lab mod module takes place over two lab periods. So in the first, students work with Benchling to map all four primer sequences. And so here they get practice annotating the primer binding sites, determining the size of the PCR product, and determining the numbers and the sizes of the restriction fragments they expect to obtain after ban one digestion. So all of this is fairly um, intuitive and, and fairly visual for students um, as they're using Benchling. So this interactive exercise is really useful because it helps students visualize where primers are binding. Um, it emphasizes ideas like reverse complementarity, um, more so than sort of the colored boxes in the PCR diagram from the previous slide. So in the wet lab component, students are given one of the four primer sets, but they aren't told which one, which gene it amplifies. Um, so students extract yeast DNA, they perform PCR with their unknown primer, uh, and they analyze it by gel electrophoresis. And they then need to interpret the banding pattern they got after digestion, relating it back to their expectations from their benchling analysis. So in this case, getting two, um, two fragments after digestion meant they had amplified with primers um, for HIS5, the gene HIS5, getting four restriction fragments meant they had amplified um, a portion of lice2. So without having performed the benchling analysis themselves, students may not have had a good understanding really of what these um, band sizes correspond to. 
So students really enjoy using Benchling. Um, I get a lot of uh, students coming up to me afterwards asking if there are bioinformatics clubs they can join or, or other courses they can take to to learn more um, more of these skills. So from anonymous end of term feedback, students also mentioned that Benchling is really fun. They really enjoy using it and it really helps to um, solidify their learning. So this exercise takes very little prep time, uh, just designing and testing a few primers. It could be modified in countless ways depending on goals and timing and, and resources. Um, and I would like to further um, sort of explore how using programs like Benchling can be leveraged to help students visualize and really connect with um, molecular concepts, maybe with or without a wet lab component. So thank you very much for, for listening and thank you for the invitation. Thank you so very much for a great lightning talk. Um, our next lightning talk is, Tina, you can have, uh, please share your screen from University of Massachusetts, Boston. The floor is yours. Great, thank you so much. Um, I'd like to start by also thanking the organizers. Um, and my name is Tina Kelleher. I'm a new professor at UMass Boston. And today I'll tell you a little story about how we're reworking the undergraduate bioinformatics lab to um, update the annotation for Neurospora crossa. So a little bit about the course. We have 24 students at the 300 level biology majors. So they've seen genetics, cell biology, and evolutionary biology. The project occurs in the lab section, which meets weekly for three hours. And the students are using these um, somewhat archaic Dell machines um, shown here. We actually got a Unix-like environment running through Ubuntu um, that I'm happy to talk in the Q&A and comments about how we installed that and some other programs listed here. So the data type that students are working with is unpublished from my research lab. And we use Neurospora Crossa to study the circadian clock. And many of you may have heard of Neurospora from teaching genetics, the sort of one gene, one enzyme hypothesis. And some of you may know that since the days of Beetle and Tatum, we now know every single metabolite, every single enzyme, every single pathway that occurs in Neurospora growth. We've reached 20 years with the genome sequence, and we have a knockout collection of all the non-essential single gene knockouts. So some of you may ask, and students as well, well, what more is there to learn from this model organism that we've had so much uh, success with? So my lab's very interested in regulation of the transcriptome, especially at the three prime end. And there are thousands of genes that still do not have an annotated three prime UTR in Neurospora, even with all of this background knowledge. So in comes the undergraduate students. We break our bioinformatics students into groups of three to four students in a group. We walk them through the genome annotation through a publication uh, that came out concurrent with the genome in 2004. Each student group picks a different kind of gene, so kinases, transcription factors. We have a group working on sulfur metabolic enzymes this semester, and they form a hypothesis that that group of genes is regulated by the nutrient environment and by circadian uh, time, which is the nature of the data set that we give to them for this project. The students then do their own literature search and query the database to get a smaller subgroup of genes in that category. So in this way, we can give the students data that measures all 10,000 genes, but they can sort of take a little bite-sized piece of that data by only focusing on 20 to 30 genes in their category. And we use the algorithms listed here to start to query this data set. And I've shown you a small um, screenshot here of what the data looks like. So we did three prime end sequencing, and this gives us two very useful pieces of information. First, we can estimate how highly uh, or not highly genes are expressed in different conditions, either by nutrients or over circadian clock time. And we can also assay where the poly A tail is located from this data set. Um, because the reads come from the extreme three prime end of each gene. And we are looking for interesting cases, uh, as shown here, where there may be multiple sites where the poly A tail can go. So students um, go from raw data to analysis for their 20 genes, and they can ask questions like, does the poly A tail change over time? How does gene expression change? 
uh, and things like this. And I've shown this particular example. This is probably the best characterized circadian clock gene that exists in Neurospora. And you can hopefully see here that the annotation is actually incomplete. The poly-A tail is downstream of where the genome says the gene should end. And this is where the students are adding value. Um, and so with that, I will wrap up and I'd be happy to answer any questions in the chat or Q&A. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. That was excellent. Um, so next we'll move on to Dr. Shermer from Northeastern Illinois University. Sorry, give me one second. We had the sharing all worked out before and now my display settings are all messed up. There we go. I think you're all looking at the presentation now. Um, wonderful. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for the invitation. I'm really excited uh, to be here and talk with you a little bit about a cure that I developed for the General Biology II classroom. Uh, I'm Aaron Shermer. I'm a professor at Northeastern Illinois University, uh, which is a Hispanic serving primarily undergraduate institution located in the city of Chicago. And our general biology two curriculum covers uh, evolution, generally covers evolution, uh, physiology, plant and animal diversity, and ecology. Uh, and while the plant diversity and ecology components uh, are sort of well represented in the lecture material in this course, uh, they were underrepresented in the lab. Uh, and so I developed a cure using sugar beets uh, to try to address this deficiency. And I also wanted to develop this cure because uh, a lot of the cures that I was familiar with tended to target the upper level students. And I wanted to get students early in the major involved in authentic uh, research experiences. So the cure uh, is a fairly straightforward uh, experiment. We grew the sugar beets uh, in uh, control soil, which is just regular potting mix and then soil with a, a fertilizer amendment. Uh, the students grew the plants uh, for four weeks and through those four weeks they measured the growth and then quantified the impact of fertilizer on plant growth. We then collected soil samples uh, from the root surface and extracted total DNA from those soil samples. We sent those samples out for metagenome sequencing, and then we used those metagenomes to quantify microbial diversity across these two groups. And so you might be asking yourself uh, why uh, I chose sugar beets. Uh, one, sugar beets are really easy to grow uh, in the greenhouse or in the lab. Uh, sugar beets are also an important agricultural resource. About 50% of domestic sugar or U.S. sugar is uh, from sugar beets. Sugar beets are also gaining a lot of traction in sort of the biofuel sectors. Uh, and I also just learned uh, this semester that uh, byproducts of the sort of sugar beet industry, sugar beet juice, is commonly used in ice and snow removal uh, programs, which in a city like Chicago uh, is sort of a really big deal and really interesting to the students. Uh, sugar beets are also a, a great model for how uh, genetics can be used for to improve plant performance. Uh, and sugar beets have sort of a really interesting history, uh, and there are potential DEI connections uh, in that history. You may also be wondering how we do the microbial uh, micro the the meta genome analysis uh, and so for that we're using the doe systems biology knowledge base or k base for short uh, this is a free suite of sophisticated systems biology and bioinformatics tools uh, that if the students have a web browser they can access this sort of extreme computing power to run these analyses and i found that uh KBase sort of gets around a lot of the command line issues that a lot of students suffer uh, suffer from, and it, that it's really easy to use and it's very scalable um, across uh, different classroom and laboratory settings. So 
Uh, I believe that by combining sort of this interesting model with powerful real world tools that like like those available in KBase, we can get students early in their biology education to be participating in authentic research. I, I also think that this raises uh, awareness of agricultural and bioinformatic researches, exposes students to alternative careers. Um, this also uh, gets students engaged with uh, quantitative and statistical reasoning, gets them experience with cutting edge tools, uh, and I hope increases interest uh, in plant physiology and ecology. So if these kinds of experiments are, are interesting to you or you'd like to do these kinds of analyses, uh, there is a K-based educators group that I am a part of. Um, they're always looking for more folks to come and participate. Uh, they have a lot of really tremendous resources and um, sort of workflows to do a, a variety of different bioinformatic and systems biology um, analyses. And so if you're interested in that, you can click the QR code there and get some more information. Um, thank you all so much for your attention, and I'm happy to chat more about this experiment or, or some of the specifics during the Q&A. Okay, great. Thank you, Dr. Shermer. Uh, so next we have um, Dr. Dancic from Eastern Connecticut University. And did you need me to share your slides? Uh, yes, I do. That would okay. be great. All right, thank you. Um, so my name is Garrett Dancic. I'm a professor in computer science at Eastern Connecticut State University, and I'm going to be describing work that I've done with my colleague, Amy Groth, uh, who's from the Department of Biological Sciences. Um, before I go, I do want to thank the, the organizers and also thank you, April, for, for controlling the slides. Um, I'll just say next uh, when it's time to go to the, the next slide or to move the animation forward. Um, so this project, uh, it's a collaboration between biology and computer science students uh, in a class project that's designed to reflect bioinformatics in the real world. You can go to the next slide. The biologists uh, in this scenario are students in a cancer biology course, and they're working with bioinformaticians who are students in a bioinformatics course, but a course that's primarily taken by computer science majors. And the project works as follows. Next. Um, you could actually hit next of like five times. <laughs> we might as well show everything. Um, so the biologists write up a summary of, of their objective, which is to identify candidate um, targets of a gene such as FOS1. Um, the bioinformaticians then a downloaded a download C elegans promoter regions to identify genes that contain the FOS1 binding consens consensus sequence in their promoters. Um, the bioinformatics students then identify human orthologs, obtain gene summaries, and they accomplish all of that by writing a Python code in order to process data that they get from various databases. Um, the bioinformatics students then send a list of candidate target genes to the biology students. The biology students pick a target gene and then experimentally verify it using RNAi against FOS1 and then qPCR uh, to measure the expression of the target gene. And then finally, the students write up their work and give a joint final presentation um, to the instructors. So in this process, these students are learning about various bioinformatics tools and databases. Um, the bioinformatics students who don't have as strong of a biology background are learning more about the biology background. And they're also gaining an understanding of how with bioinformatics, you're really making predictions that then have to be experimentally verified. Uh, in addition to that, both groups are getting experience communicating with each other, which I think is one of the most important aspects of this uh, project, where they're learning to communicate with other students with different backgrounds. Um, this project, as described, is a semester-long project, but parts of it can be adapted into smaller projects. You can go to the next slide. Right. So, for example, biology students 
uh, can use various databases to get information about specific genes, um, which can help them select a gene for either for further study or research, uh, including experimentation. Um, some examples include they could get gene summaries, find orthologs uh, using databases such as NCBI and Biomart. Um, you can hit next two more times. <laughs> Uh, the biology students can also get experience just with the communication with, with others uh, that don't necessarily have the, the biological background that they do. So they can request analysis from computer science students or possibly data science students. Those students can then write code to identify sequences with conserved uh, elements, uh, as well as code that can combine different sources of biological information. Um, in a way, it's a trivial thing to do, but for computer science students, that's actually a great important or a great programming exercise um, that is used in a lot of general cases. Um, and the nice thing is that the CS students don't necessarily need a strong uh, background in biology as long as they're able to understand the what the task is. And so to, to wrap this up, I encourage biology faculty to work with computer science colleagues. I'm in computer science, so I might be biased, um, but I really think it's a, it's a great way to develop projects that would mutually benefit students from both programs. So thank you, and I'm happy to answer questions in the chat or uh, answer questions during the Q&A. Okay, great. Thank you, Dr. Danzig. Uh, so next we have um, Dr. Matter from Cabrini University. You can go ahead and share your screen. Hey, um, thank you to the organizers uh, for um, getting inviting me to speak. Um, I'm going to talk uh, about the Genome Solver project. Uh, this is a this was a NSF funded project, and now all the material that we have. Uh, is on cubes so thank you to cubes for able for the ability to host uh, all of our stuff there uh, again i put uh, our uh, our link on the chat in the chat but if you want to scan that qr code it'll be there uh, for my three slides so you can always kind of connect with the group as well um, so i am vinayak mathur i am a assistant professor at cabrini university and then we have uh, two of our collaborators uh, gaurav arora who's going to be speaking right after me uh, and then Anne Rosenwald, who was the lead PI on this project. So what are some of the opportunities uh, with the Genome Solver project? So what we try to work with are these um, publicly available genomic data sets. So um, both like NCBI and JGI, there is a lot of information uh, on there uh, that has been deposited and it is just waiting there for uh, all of you to kind of use with your students. Uh, we also try to, in our modules, try to use uh, freely available bioinformatic tools. So again, um, things like Muscle, Mega, Progressive, Mov, uh, kind of making sure that there is no additional kind of cost burden to the students um, and kind of make these tools accessible. Um, and then the, the beauty of this is that you can get students involved in, in genuine research projects, right? So uh, we can either run uh, this uh, our modules as a, as a full cure. So I teach a bioinformatics course where I use uh, all of our modules, which I'll show you on the next slide. But there's also an opportunity to kind of use uh, single modules as it kind of fits in your course. So if you're teaching a genetics course, uh, you could take uh, stuff from the from the genome solver resor resources and use it for class activities or uh, a way to kind of um, um, as a teaching tool for your students. So the beauty of these genuine research projects is, uh, especially with the stuff that we are doing, uh, I really like to emphasize that that you're kind of and people know this with bioinformatics, you're, you're really kind of um, hitting all these biology stats and cover science uh, kind of objectives. So if you have learning objectives or if you're looking at uh, quantitative stuff, uh, Genome Solver provides that opportunity to, in to involve your students a little bit into stats. And I'll give an example of the computer science part and of course the biology. Um, and obviously um, we want to do a bunch of hypothesis testing with our students so that it also gives you an opportunity to kind of design a, a research project um, where, you, where you get to test that. So my colleague, Dr. Uh, Gaurav Arora, who's speaking right after me, is going to tell you about some student projects that he has been uh, kind of uh, mentoring. Um, so you can identify projects that can 
complement your curricular and or research needs. Uh, I am at a very small university. We don't have a lot of uh, resources. So I use a lot of genome solver material uh, for kind of uh, as my research, but also using the cure model and involving students uh, while you're teaching. So um, I basically want to emphasize today uh, our community science project um, and our Python pipeline. Um, we have our GitHub page, so github.com slash genome solver, uh, where we have all our information kind of stored uh, in there. So um, again, it hits some of those computer science uh, aspects as well. So what is the workflow? What is the pipeline that we are talking about? So we are kind of interested in prokaryotic, prokaryotic genomes. And some of our big research questions, which we pitch to our students, is thinking about um, the questions of horizontal gene transfer, right? So how are fate genes um, kind of embedded in bacterial genomes? What are they doing there? What is the functionality? And maybe kind of trying to get into mechanism, which is a little difficult with just dry lab stuff. You kind of want to get into wet lab. So what we do, these are an example of the workflow uh, that it, uh, that is there. So module one, starting very simply, kind of introducing students uh, to BLAST, thinking about how you, you can search the database, where that information is found. Uh, we then kind of get into different uh, databases that are available where students can kind of access uh, the data. We then move a little bit into genome annotation. We have, and all of these modules have hands-on exercises built along with it. So there, so you don't really have to kind of develop anything on your own. You just go into a resource list and take your, take your PowerPoint and the materials that are kind of developed already for you, or you can always use your own material and then use our exercises uh, in your classroom. Um, then once we kind of let the put the groundwork, we start with the community science project, which involves with search using a fate gene or a protein and searching for that in a bacterial database, trying to find evidences of horizontal gene transfer. Um, you once you find your evidence of, of gene transfer, then you can start your data analysis. Um, Here's the, the cool computer science aspect. We have a Python pipeline that we have been developing to kind of automate the process. So kind of uh, increasing our data output. And then finally, we have our uh, four modules where we do the data analysis with comparative genomics, phylogenetics, and syntony. So again, all these materials are available on our resource list. Everything is on cubes. And the beauty is that if you don't want to do this whole pipeline and you just want to pick uh, certain things in there, that is also an option for you. So I've put in my email address at the bottom over here, and then I'll be happy to answer any questions later on as well. Okay, great. Thank you, Dr. Matter. Uh, next, we have Dr. Aurora from Gallaudet University. You can go ahead and share your screen. Okay, uh, can you all see my screen? I'll just put it in um, presentation mode. So all okay with the screen? Okay. So I realize I'm uh, strategically put towards the end. And so I'm right between you and to, you know, the almost the end of this conference on a Friday afternoon. So I'll just get into what I'm going to be talking about. So I'm Gaurav Arora. I'm an associate professor of biology at Gallaudet University. Those who are not familiar with Gallaudet University, it's a university whose mission is to educate deaf and deaf and hard of hearing and deaf blind students. So 85% of our population, student population is deaf, deaf, hard of hearing and deaf blind students. So as uh, Vinayak uh, talked a little bit about the Genome Solver Project overall, I'm gonna be talking about the implementation of this in the classroom. And I do have my the QR code up there. If you wanna to go to my website, it also has the uh, you know link to uh, Genome Solver. So uh, as Vinayak mentioned, we do have a number of modules uh, associated with the Genome Solver Project. And I implemented this in my uh, fall 2022 bioinformatics class, which was uh, cross-listed along with the IT course as well as the data science course. And uh, most of the students were undergraduate, junior, seniors, and a mix of public health, biology, and I IT um, majors. So here was the methods that we used in this class. We, you know, like Vinayak mentioned, we do a database search. We do homology search using BLAST. We did the uh, multiple sequence alignment. We did, we created phylogenetic trees. We did syntony analysis to verify HGT. But I want to step back and say that I did take all the genome solver material 
And I did test it before I implemented in the class because when we talk about genome solver, there are a number of uh, viral proteins which uh, we use, but I tested them to make sure that we could actually get some kind of hypothesis driven questions for the class. So I took accession numbers associated with some, um, with a virus. Uh, and I think the name of the protein which we are working was was the tape, the tail tape measure protein. And what we did, the function of this in the phage is to kind of, you know, create, uh, to enter, it helps the phage to enter the bacteria. So it seems like it has an important function in the phage. And so we were curious, you know, when the phage enters the bacteria, does it leave it up there? Because, and does the bacteria keep it? Because bacterial genomes, as we know, are very compact. If they don't need anything, they, there's mechanisms to kind of get rid of it. And what we saw was that, in fact, this tape measure protein was present in the bacteria. This was confirmed by a homology search using BLAST. And you can see the BLAST results up here. I'll just put an annotation. And um, on top is the phage uh, hit, and the remaining hits below that are all the bacterial hits. So that was interesting. We also did um, reverse um, uh, blast where, you know, we took the bacterial accession number and hit it against the, and try to see if we get the phage results. And we did get it. We did, um, you know, the multiple sequence alignment. We also did the uh, phylogenetic analysis, which I'm not shown for the purpose of this talk. And then we did the synteny analysis, which is shown up here. And on top, you can see you have the phage right here, the phage tape, uh, tape measure protein. And at the bottom, you see all the bacterial hits up here. This was, we took the nucleotide, anal uh, nucleotide sequence associated with this protein to do this analysis. And we did see that in the different bacterial strains, the uh, gene was present, but in different locations. But what was interesting was that it was not only the tape measure protein which had moved or which was in the bacterial strains, we also saw other proteins which had moved along with this tape measure protein in the bacterial strains. And um, this was, um, this class goes for 14 weeks, but we spent 10 weeks on it. And I had to step back after every three weeks to remind the students where we were. And then we also try to find evidence of expression in uh, of this uh, gene in uh, different bacterial strains. So we did find some RNA-seq studies where the gene was expressed. The we I then ran this, uh, you know, took the data and gave it Hola. a study to some students. But what was more interesting was the documentation of the American Sign Language um, signs that we used to kind of, you know, discuss different concepts in the class. And with that, um, I would end my talk. I would uh, need to remove all these annotations. But this is the last slide, and I'd be happy to answer any questions at the end. Thank you, Dr. Orr. Uh, so now we can pass it to Sean for to moderate the, the Q&A for the lightning talks. All right. Thank you, April. <clears throat> Those are some really good talks. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, I do have some questions. I think there has been some discussions going on in the chat, uh, but also I'll, I'll repeat some of these questions just in case you haven't been following along in the chat. If you have more questions for any of our lightning talk, uh, Presenters, please uh, feel free to put those in the chat as well. So first question uh, was for Cole, if Cole is here. Uh, how much instruction do you give your uh, students regarding how to use C BioPortal? Oh, good question. I'm glad that was asked. Yeah. Um, so this was a really small project at the end of the semester. And so I did about like a 25 minute lecture going through how to use it like in a tutorial. And for the rest of like the three hours worth of lab, um, I would walk around, help students one on one, and they would get help from each other. And they really just had a three hour period to come up with their project as well as time outside of lab, office hours, and then they presented them five minutes a piece at the next lab session. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Tina, um, if you're here, um, someone was interested in hearing about your Ubuntu setup, and I know 
uh, they had asked you, I think in the chat, but could you fill everybody in on that? Yeah, sure. So um, we have an IT department that will install all the programs that we need. So I just sort of contact them ahead of time, a couple of weeks ahead of the course to tell them what we need. Um, and I asked about a Unix-like environment, thinking we would have to do sort of a virtual machine or SIGWIN or something that can be kind of heavy to install. But it turns out Windows 10 and beyond, there's something called WSL, which if you Google WSL Unix for um, Windows, you can find it. Um, and it seems very easy to do. As I said, IT kind of installed it, um, but I uh, monitored the process and it, it comes up just like a command line on a Linux or a Mac um, and it works great. So I'd recommend WSL. Excellent, thank you. One more for you. How do you teach about annotation? You mentioned a paper, if I heard it correctly. Yeah, so I linked the paper in the chat with that question, um, but since we have the, the genome got published in 2003 and in 2004, there was a 100 page follow up paper full of tables of individual genes of different functional categories. So although the length of the paper is very daunting, I tell the students just to skim it and read the sections relevant to the category of genes they are interested in. Excellent. Thank you. Um... Dr. Polvey, um, is Benchling easy to demonstrate to your students? Um, yeah, it's uh, um, uh, pretty pretty intuitive. I make a, a screencast video, so I show myself sort of um, highlighting sequences and where to find the restriction sites and what button to click. And they seem to really appreciate um, this video as, as they're non-programmers non as well. But yes, it's, um, it's very intuitive and um, it is free as well for academics and education purposes. Students just have to make an account with their email address, but otherwise, um, yeah, very easy. No, no subscription required then. No subscription. <laughs> At least, yeah, doesn't cost money. Yeah, good, thank you. Um, let's see, Dr. Shermer, how, where did you uh, send your set of samples for metagenomics? Was it expensive? And thank you for your talk. Yeah, thank you uh, for the question. Uh, so we use Seacoast um, and uh, we use some money, uh, the, uh, K-Base right now has a, a RCN UBE pilot grant. We used some money off of that, and it was it was about a hundred dollars. Um, and I, I I'm happy to put this in the the chat too. Uh, it was uh, I put the specifics. Yeah, it was uh, a four hundred megabases, two point seven million reads, like medium coverage it was about a hundred dollars through Seacoast. Uh, the second question is uh, somebody's teaching in bio two for the first time in the fall and would love to incorporate something like this. Do you think large blocks of time and or specifically a lab setup is necessary or can you modify your ideas to fit in a 1.5 hour twice a week lecture section? Uh, yeah, also a really, really great question. Thank you. So I, I think as far as the sort of plant growth, plant measurements, that is very easy to do in the the 1.5 hour. So so we have uh, once a week, two hour and 50 minute lab blocks, uh, but I'm only spending the first 45 minutes hour where the students are actually doing the measurements and, and getting their data together for the graphs. Um, so I think that part would be very easy. Uh, the DNA extraction, depending on how efficient your students are, um, could take a little bit longer. Um, I have, we do the soil extraction on one day and then uh, flash freeze those soil samples and then bring them back the following week to actually go through and, and use the kit. Um, uh, we use the Zymo Biomics kit, which uh, folks talked about before. Zymo is also really great. They will give you, you lots of free samples. So if you and a couple students send them an email, you can easily get, you know, 15, 20 uh, reactions. Um, but uh, so, so again, I think that could be done. The other nice thing about uh, K-Base as far as the analysis goes, so you can do as much or as little as you want. Uh, and so it can almost be like a cooking show, like, hey, here's what goes in. And voila, here's what the output looks like. Um, and so I think, again, that would be really easy to do within a 1.5 hour 
um, class period. Excellent. Thank you very much. This is for Dr. Dancic. Uh, so somebody wanted to know if Biomart is open source resource or do they need a subscription? Uh, you do not need a subscription for Biomart. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. And this is uh, for, I think, probably um, our last two speakers, but it's specifically addressed to Dr. Aurora. Um, why do you think that this is HGT, but not just lysogenic integration of the phage genome into the bacterial chromosome? So I think uh, from some of the studies that we published earlier uh, on, you know, the same mechanism, we did see we thought it was lysogenic, but then we did see, you know, some function associated with these viral genes in the bacteria. And lyso I mean, lysogenic processes enable horizontal gene transfer. So we are also, you know, looking at that. So, I mean, it could be that, but based on what we've seen on our previous publications, where, you know, viral genes were left in the bacteria, we associated function with that. So based on those studies, we suspect this is a GT. Okay, good. And then people are interested in the ASL documentation oh, yes. as um, well. Yeah, so uh, I just forgot to mention that this uh, past year, 2023, we are celebrating the STEM ASL, the year of the STEM uh, lexicon, ASL lexicon. And there's a big conference in March at Gallaudet University. Um, I, as a hearing person, uh, cannot publish this. I need to get this, you know, through my deaf colleagues before I, you know, get this published or documented. But if for anyone interested, we do have um, the STEM lexicon um, website, which I put on the, the, the conference. And after that, they will publish uh, all these lexicon on a uh, separate, and this is an S NSF funded project. So they will be publishing these lexicons after this conference. Awesome. Well, thank you all very much. Uh, appreciate all the, all the good questions and the, and the great talks. And I think we're going to uh, do a little closing remarks. Okay. Um, yeah, I think people have been really great about sharing their contact information. So uh, the conversation can hopefully continue offline. Um, it's late here on the East Coast, so probably we should let you go pretty soon. But um, we also built in a little bit of time. If you can stay till 5 p.m., we were thinking we could just kind of have more of like an informal social gathering on Zoom. If people are free and want to hang around, it might be nice to at least kind of simulate an in-person environment where there could be lots of networking and connections being made. So just to close, the official webinar tonight, um, I wanna thank everyone who presented. The talks were amazing. I um, put so many new bookmark tabs on my Firefox and I hope that I have time to <laughs> carefully go through all of them. Um, this was really, really informative. So thank you everybody who presented. I also wanna thanks, give a big thanks to all the participants. We had close to 200 participants, so that was like a big success. And I want to just remind everybody that Brewmore is a totally grassroots organization. We all just volunteer our time because we find it really gratifying and enriching to connect with other educators across the country. The group was started by the yeast genetics community in 2020 during the pandemic to provide online resources for people teaching in the Zoom environment during the pandemic. So that has its drawbacks because we don't ever see each other in person, but it also is awesome because we're all over, we're multinational, you know, we've got US and Canada at least, if not other countries represented. And, um, you know, we, we always wanna keep in touch and have new members. So I'm gonna put our website again in the chat. If you haven't signed up, for our mailing list, please sign up. We also every year solicit new steering committee members. 
So it would be great if you want to have extra time and contribute extra brain power to this organization and our mission of bringing experiential learning to the undergraduate classroom. That would be awesome. And I'm going to send everybody a post uh, webinar survey form to fill out. And if you could just take, you know, a minute or two to fill that out and let us know what type of programming you'd like to see in the future, that would be amazing for all of us too. So I'm um, so happy we did this and thank you everyone for coming.